When the silver tray is polished and the cocktail napkins linen, when the waiter's wearing white gloves, you know it's martini time with Brennan Schmidt. First off, welcome to the inaugural podcast titled Martini Time. I'm your host, Brennan Schmidt, co-author of Cyber City Safe, Emergency Planning Beyond the Maginot Line. Joining me is Dr. Alan Bonner, also co-author of Cyber City Safe, Emergency Planning Beyond the Maginot Line. Now, we, I, think, I think I remember from linguistics that co means two, and thus there's you and there's me, and I'm not Brennan Schmidt, so we now have martini time and the gang is all here. There has been a bit of a delay with the glitches, and I don't know whether uh, we use um, proper unionized technicians such as Nabit, Actra, uh, Iatsi, what have you, but we, we had such a delay that the zest, which I usually keep frozen, has thawed a bit, so it doesn't make that wonderful clink. However, we are at least here on the inaugural, and I noticed that there was no playing of Hail to the Chief or any other such music, uh, God Save the Queen in our country, we might do, um, but at any rate, we are here. That's right, and I, I would say cheers to that. Um, and solidarity these days is alone. This is actually a, a quarantini, which is a martini that you drink alone. Cheers. Wow. Mm. Now, pardon me, my generation would remember the great Jackie Gleason. Mm, that's good booze. You have so much to learn, Brennan. I, in, indeed, I, I do. Indeed, I do. Now, why don't we start with some good news, because these are awful times, and people are scared, and rightly so. But wasn't it wonderful to see that jerry-built um, ventilator that can now serve, you know, six or nine or some such number of people? There is going to be an infection control issue, but somebody got the idea to, um, you know, ramp up the creativity and make more ventilators where there used to only be one. I think that's great. There is a wonderful book that I don't get uh, any portion of the royalty, but it's uh, the great Robert Gordon's book, uh, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. He's a Northwestern University professor, and it's 700 pages of beautiful detailed analysis of why growth occurs, which is kind of an important topic these days, and he noted that during World War II, it took about 30 days to build a Liberty ship, and there were, you know, shipbuilding yards in a couple of different places in California, and they learned by doing, meaning they tried new things, new methods, and they even had a contest, and I think they got building a Liberty ship down to about a day and a half. So we are going to learn lots in, in these horrible times, and I think we should keep an open mind uh, to that learning. That's the, that's so right. And if if we take a look at at uh, just the example that you shared, it's it's a great example of how we're really disrupting uh, the way that we're thinking, and we are going to great lengths to challenge the status quo, and ultimately transform what will likely be a very different economy in in more ways than one. Yeah, um, I, by the way, I use a water, and this is that, um, I forget the brand, Soda Stream water, thank you very much. Not one of our sponsors, but uh, plain old water as a chaser, and that's more environmentally sound. I mean, there's one thing. What are we all doing walking around with plastic bottles that we throw in the ocean, and then some uh, neo-hippie gets the idea of having a, um, what, what do you call those things that don't actually exist? Uh, uh, a social impact bond. They're not bonds, they're not very social, and they don't have much impact. This could be simply called government procurement or a uh, request for proposal. They're bending over backwards trying to figure out a way to mine that plastic floating around the ocean and turning it into park benches. I mean, good for them, but how about banning those bottles, period, full stop, thank you, it was nice while it lasted, but we're not using that anymore. Same thing with uh, speaking of the economy. We've been asking the wrong question for about 100 years. 
How do we move more people around? Well, dig a hole in the ground, build a bridge over the river, dig a hole under the river, uh, get uh, motorized skateboards. I mean, it, just any conceivable way of moving people around. And what you and I are learning right now is we can work and make a decent living and be productive sitting right here. Cheers. Cheers to that indeed. It's it's funny you should mention the grocery store because I I always think of of how often I sometimes forget the the reusable bag and then you feel guilty getting the plastic bag but then you invariably end up using that for a garbage garbage can liner or something something to that effect. But what would be greater than going back to the days when you had paper bags? Because as we're talking about what kind of craziness is, is uh, potentially going to unfold here post the, uh, the isolation period, is, uh, is all the cameras that are in use. So just imagine having those brown paper bags that you can wear over your head. Like they are in short supply. Like really, let's think about it. We have a, a toilet paper obsession maybe the next iteration of toilet paper is going to be brown paper bags so that we can put them over our heads what are your thoughts on that well it's going to be extremely important the next time a, a cipher clerk such as igor gazenko uh in, initiates a cold war action from right here in canada he wore um i think he wore a pillowcase but the brown paper bag is uh, biodegradable it's probably more sanitary you're not washing it the full life cycle cost of a brown paper bag is is way less than a um, a, a pillowcase uh, and so i think those are going to come in very very handy in this new normal where there's facial recognition and cameras everywhere uh, in the new kind of um, economy uh, good thinking brennan but you know i i'd like to name drop i'm in all these books back here many of which I, i've assigned uh staff to read because I, I'm pretty thorough. Um, Barry Commoner is one of the great names from the ecology movement, 1971, I think it was. He had four environmental dicta. Now having named four, I'm not gonna be able to remember them. But one of them was, there's no free lunch. You use the brown paper bag, it gets a little wet because you had some vegetables or something in there, uh, or you put garbage in it and the bottom falls out. So that is unsanitary right there. You use the plastic bag, maybe you can, re, you can, you can certainly reuse it once for garbage. And we have to think of, is there a way to reuse some of this stuff because there is no free lunch. That paper bag gives off methane, in landfill, the plastic bag amounts to about 8% of the weight or bulk of a landfill. So, um, and, and the canvas bag, which I love, I get them at uh, L.L. Bean and elsewhere, these great big canvas bags. Uh, you use them over and over again and they probably get unsanitary, but you know, that's life. No free lunch is what Barry Commoner said. He also said, everything goes somewhere. Nature knows best. And I forget the fourth, but it was great stuff. You can Google this stuff now. It's easy. And, and for the record, you, you mentioned a couple of times that you forgot. That's just because it's simply forgetting and not because that was two martinis and, and you were just working on your first, right? No, exactly. And it also uh, is a make work project. People might want to tune in next week and uh, we could catch up with what we forgot. By the way, I want to call out a very famous Canadian, um, Paul Anka. Uh, who's uh, one of whose relatives I worked with at the CBC, uh, Andy Anka, his father had a tremendous restaurant in Ottawa. And he is, of course, the author of uh, It Doesn't Matter Anymore that Buddy Holly uh, released posthumously and recorded. They were friends, they toured together. Uh, Paul Anka, of course, did Diana. But you're wondering why Mr. Anka would come into this program. He had a minor hit in the 50s called uh, Toot Sweet, and he repurposed that as Johnny Carson's theme song in the great late night talk show. Now, and I know for your generation, the great late night talk show was like last night with Jimmy Fallon. But, you know, there was uh, before Jimmy Fallon, Johnny Carson, 30 years on The Tonight Show, followed uh, Jack Parr and uh, Steve Allen. So Paul Anka repurposed um, I Love You Baby, Oh Yes I Do, and it became Johnny's theme. And the folklore has it that he made $300 a night 
every time that theme was played and Johnny got a co-writing credit. And Johnny probably made some money even when he was making zillions a year. So I'm calling it Paul Anka. These are tough times. We need a theme song for Martini Time. And wait a minute. Toot Sweet Martini Time. Does it have a similar number of syllables? I think Mr. Anka, who's one of the great songwriters of all time, saw him in Las Vegas, he should donate a theme song to us. What do you say? I, I think that's an incredible idea. I think that we should definitely uh, see if we can make that happen. And he also, of course, translated Come d'habitude for our French-speaking uh, listeners into, of course, My Way. And now the end is near. Uh, what time do we have, Brendan? Do we have more time for this uh, stuff? I, I guess as shut-ins, we have the rest of our lives, right? We, we really do. And the fact that we are able to produce this ourselves and we don't have to uh, have, have a producer telling us uh, about what, uh, what, what time we have left, we might as well just make use of that freedom. But at the same time, we want to be mindful that our, our viewers probably are going to say, well, what can I look forward to next? So I guess that's the question. What are we plotting and scheming here as we uh, encourage our users to tune in each week in order to find out more secrets to making the best martini you can imagine. Uh, there will be Beaumont, uh, witty repartee, uh, rejoinders, uh, anecdotes, ethnographic testimony. Uh, there will be the whole range of, of interesting things. And speaking of producers, let me tell you that I got into broadcasting just before there were producers. And one of the great uh, morning show hosts of all time, Bill Guest in Winnipeg, I think it's Sheila, uh, Sheila Coles holds the record about 20 years in Regina. But before her time, it was Bill Guest in Winnipeg, did it for 13, 16 years, I think. Well, out came a whole bunch of producers from Ryerson and they would hit the talk back and say to the host, oh, ask more about that or do that or ask Brennan, does he use an olive or a, a cocktail onion and this sort of thing. Bill Guest didn't like that. Bill Guest took off his earpiece, put it down as the producer was talking to him, finished the interview, turned the mic off. They hit a little piece of music called a sting. And Bill got on the talk back and said, if you want to talk to me, invite me out for a coffee after the show. Otherwise, keep your finger off that blanking button. So that's producers. And we don't have one. That it's, it's very interesting that you should mention that story because I seem to recall that that there was this one famous time where you kind of ended up changing the role. Usually you, you're you the one asked questions, but tell us briefly about <laughs> where, where, you, where you ended up famously um, turning the table on, on the, the person who was interviewing you. Well, by the way, if you want to produce, I could do this. This is stretch. Uh, this is uh, wrap it up. This is stop. Uh, I think this is elbowing. That's face mask and uh, hooking, I think. At any rate, that's what producers do. Well, I was on the, uh, a guest on the morning show in Fredericton, which is a place that I had worked, and uh, Terry Segge is the host, and he asked me why I thought that the uh, city government and emergency management people um, should tell people in Fredericton where they need to go. Is it the Woo Center? Is it the Lady Beaverbrook Arena, you know, is it the, the, the gym? You know, where is above the floodplain? I was being interviewed about this fantastic book, which you co-authored, Cyber City Safe. So Terry asked me this question. I said, well, hold on. I know there's a division of labor here. You're supposed to ask questions. I'm supposed to answer them. But let me switch roles and pretend I'm still the host of the show uh, 35 years later. What is wrong with the government telling us what their plans are in a pandemic, in an emergency, in a flood, a snowstorm, etc.? If they don't have plans, they should admit it and get some plans. But we're just Joe citizens. You know, we've paid our taxes. Uh, we don't know hydrology. We don't know engineering. We don't know uh, some of these technical things, meteorology. The government has all this information. All I want to know is, where is the high ground? Where do we go? Are there any supplies there? Is there any food there? That's why I think it's uh, it's relevant. And if they don't know, they should admit they don't and find out. Well, that's very true. And I'm I remember you and I were chatting about the excellent clip of the uh, official from the World Health Organization who just said it so well and and just had a really crisp and clear message that articulated exactly what the situation was. 
no fooling around. You are trying to outrun a virus. And if you aren't uh, working diligently ahead of the curve and in a way, very carefully overreacting, uh, doing uh, something that you think you might have to do next week, you've got to do it right this minute or you are failing. You're never get out, going to get out from, just a second now, hold on, you're never, ever going to get out from behind the eight ball. Now, that's what I've been doing for a living in the crisis management business is staying in front of the eight ball. You get behind it, you can't get out from, you can't get out from it, you're hopeless. So keep going, fast, uh, no play dates, uh, no park swings for the kids, sorry. Long walks, fresh air and sunshine is excellent, hand washing, and I didn't realize you're supposed to do this, eh, with the soap? Not just this, this, wrists, wrists, edges, thumbs, you know, et cetera. And then you can do face mask safely. Well, on that note, I think that we might as well wrap up this week's uh, segment. Again, thank you for uh, spending, spending your time creating uh, the perfected martini. Um, I, I know that, that it's a very laborious process. Um, again, viewers, you will find out in due course what the secret is, um, but I will contend that gravity does have um, a contributing factor to um, the way in which the martini is put together, despite what uh, Alan might might convince you. <laughs> no, you, look, you're absolutely right. Look, people make too much of some of these scientific matters. Remembering, I am a scientist. You do this with the, the bottle of gin, and Newton takes over. It is basically gravity, absolutely. No mystery. I wish I could charge more for this information, but it is one of the laws of physics. Simple as that. I think as a public service, we should not do this for the next six days, let people recover, and then come back better, stronger, faster. And on that note, we will be posting this and we will be doing this on a week by week basis just to see what's unfolded and also to just outlining uh, that there's some incredible stories that we can take away from this and a lot of opportunities to see what what opportunities unfold. So with if, you, that, if you have any special requests, just write them down on a $50 bill, mail them to uh, either Brennan or me. If you have complaints, please write those out, take them to a shredder, perhaps at, at Staples or somewhere in rubber gloves, have them shredded. We appreciate the feedback. And of course, doing so while maintaining a safe social distance and washing your hands after doing that process before touching your face. Bye. Uh, Bye. See you later. Until next week, we'll be polishing the silver tray, laundering the linen, and ordering extra white gloves for martini time.